Hello and welcome to the Seahawkers podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Schultz, and it is the week of the NFL Combine, the 2024 NFL Combine, as we're leading up to the draft. And we've got big men, defensive linemen who ran drills today, linebackers ran drills today, although I didn't quite get to that yet because we're recording before that's quite finished. But we that's got okay. defensive linemen to talk about. We've got some big stories. We've got Chino in the news. We've got other quarterbacks in the news, Clinton. There's, there's plenty to talk about. Clinton Bonner joining me for the show tonight. Brandon, this is a stacked news day. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, I did 35 pound curls earlier today, just, just in case the John Schneider's watching out there needs to know I didn't run a 40. I, I just didn't do that, but 35 pound curls. I'm not sure how many times, but I did them, Brandon. So it's, it's out there. I, I don't know if that is the kind of work you do to prepare for the combine because curls are not a thing that I've seen represented in the results for, for these guys unfortunately it has become it's almost beach season i'm getting back into my need to look okay in t-shirt and not <laughs> grotesque with shirt off season so uh, by which way is the beach the beach is that way it's, it's bicep <laughs> season baby I'm, I'm glad you've got that in. We've got workouts to talk about, though, and we can talk about uh, some of the defensive linemen starting out the day. And I think one of the biggest stories, Clinton, is probably going to be Braden Fisk with his performance as a defensive lineman, because um, I guess I'm always curious when I'm watching to see which one of these guys maybe takes a, a breaks out, does something you know, relatively unexpected, outperforms expectations, those types of things. And so defensive tackle Braden Fisk out of Florida State, when he went out and he like hit the top of just about every drill, every board, he, I think he made some head turns because he was a guy who I think Daniel Jeremiah had ranked kind of in the middle of the second round. But you go out and you put together that type of performance performance to where you kind of stand out among your peers in that way you know whether it's running you know at the top of the 40 yard dash times for a defensive tackle and on top of that i know you'll like this clinton uh, mm -hmm. as he crossed the line of the 40 yard dash he said oh yeah so <laughs> kind of like kool-aid man yeah the kool-aid man breaking through breaking through and he's got you know he's, he's a he's a seminal so he's got the nice uh, that maroon. So the Kool Aid Man breaking through the brick. I see a lot of a lot of things here. Braden Fisk also spells his last name with an E, so he buys the vowel at the end. So that's important. Six foot five good for me. It's good for you. It's good for you. Matches matches your last name too. Uh, six foot five, uh, around three hundred pounder. And what amazes me, Brandon, is that year after year, these dudes with this size can generate the momentum, like the, the actual momentum with their with the speed and the velocity. It's there every year it seems to get eclipsed. So it's cool when an athlete like this, uh, you know, begins jumping off the page. It's actually super cool. Like two years ago, it was like everybody knew Tariq Woolen would, they're like, oh yeah, this dude is an absolute freak. And then yes, he's an absolute freak. He runs the four, two, six Brandon Fisk. Uh, you know, this is a little bit like out of left field early. And how much of a jump do you think this gives, a uh, a guy like that you were saying he was kind of a mid-rounder so what do you think this actually does for a player like like him i don't know if it brings him into first round territory necessarily i mean it can uh but part of that too can be does uh, do other guys drop down you know how how does it shift things but it could mean a general manager who was toward the back end of the first round who's looking for a defensive tackle sees all these athletic traits and on top of that I mean, it shows a work ethic type issue to go out there and nail it at every single thing. I mean, we're talking uh, you know, 292 pounds and the dude has a broad jump of 9.9, .9, has the highest vertical leap of 33.5, 33 and a half inch vertical for a 290 pound dude. Oh, well, you know, Brandon, I must say, speaking of interior guys, the beefy boys, that makes me think of protection and Good news, Flock. We got something to show you right now. My favorite credit card has been hacked 
three times in the last four years. I wanted to understand why it keeps happening. So I Googled my name. That's a mistake. I found so much personal data floating out there and it ain't just me. Data brokers sell your information to spammers, scanners, really anybody who wants to target you. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. And it protects me from hackers who are after information like my social security number, my bank accounts and other stuff. Frankly, I don't want them to have. I get antivirus, password management, VPN, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. And I don't need to download tons of different apps. I get it all with Aura. And I get everything I just talked about at one affordable price. Look, I value my privacy and I value yours. You can go to aura.com slash Hawkra to start your two week free trial right now. And yes, of course, it is linked in this video description. Yes. And if you go there and uh, you go through the process, you get to the page of, of how you were recommended uh, to Aura and you don't see our name in the YouTube uh, drop downs, just select none. It's fine. And uh, just, uh, yeah, appreciate them helping support our show. Yeah, a great, great support and 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 really, truly actually a good service, which which is uh, which fires us up. So and and back to protection back back to those beefy boys Brandon. or a so, guy uh, that you want to break through protection with yes, Braden yes. fisk uh because i really i've not quite done you know, kind of uh gushing on him a little bit because nice one of the even as we were watching some of the drills they had cam jordan on with daniel jeremiah mm, nice. and they were doing that uh, the drill where they have the four bags like they hop up and then they have to do the footwork like over the top of the bags and around the bags and it just kind of gives you an idea of how quickly a guy can change direction, how he moves his feet. And like uh, Cam Jordan was in awe of this dude's footwork. So when, when you ask if he can be a guy who can maybe take a jump from you know, middle of the second round to the, the somewhere on the first round, I think it's the, the technical side, the work ethic side. I think that all those things, I, I just think that Braden Fisk probably made himself some money today. Yeah, I think he did as well. And the cool part about this too is for those that didn't get to see the, the combine, like you just we're gonna go through names, get the names collected, go back out to Twitter or wherever and go check out their stuff and give yourself the eyeball test as we're looking at some of these dudes. All right, so Brandon, that's the first crush. You probably got more. I, I know there's more in that bag. I mean, the, the, that's the guy who jumped out the most. And and that is one of the things where I don't know. For me, for other people, it might be a little bit different, especially if you've watched a lot of college and it's probably more to verify what you've seen right. in college. For me, it's do I see something outstanding or do I hear a story that really draws me to someone and then it makes me want to go back and then watch the film and see, oh, is this right. a guy that would be a fit? And I mean, e even for the guys who are on the, the defensive end side, like Chop Robinson, uh, who has a cool name yes, and very, cool. Uh, very important because we've seen the Seahawks draft guys with uh, you know cool names in the past. But uh, Penn State pass rusher and uh, ran a 40 of 4.48. So real fast dude off the edge. Now, mm -hmm. he, uh, he didn't run a, a second one, uh, which <laughs> tells you hey, he, he was pretty happy with that first one. Yeah, he, he said that he said that that's he, he dropped the microphone of, of sub four or five. And with chop, one thing to note too, six foot three, dude, like you're saying, but he's only 20, 21 years old. So uh, whereas whereas with Fisk, he's 24 years old. So a three year difference. Uh, if it's a quarterback, you might not mind mind all that much. But but dudes on the line, three years younger, that's that's quite a bit of time to, to you know, certainly a young and to get there to the NFL. And I do. And I was talking about Florida State. I like Penn State defensive players too. Penn State for a while now has been churning out some good defensive players. So that that's cool as well. Like you said, the good name, Brandon, I do want to ask, it, are there any folks there, you know that I'm still yearning for our next Al Woods, our next just <laughs> big, big beefy boy. I want the 350 plus pounder DT nose tackle. Is there And maybe one that could run a bit. Was there anybody who stood out from like a pure DT that's that he really played the nose in the NFL. I mean, if you're talking about a guy who maybe ran as fast as he's ever going to run for the last time, unless he does a pro day at Texas, uh, with Tavondre Sweat, 366 pounds 
and ran a 5 to 7 40 yard dash when you see that and you see a dude who is that big and can move that quickly again it's one of those things that it makes it fun because th it's the only time that you're really going to see it yeah uh yeah you don't expect uh, them to be running a 40 it's it's a uh, you know they don't you don't expect an iron man football and and george fent in this thing and making him the sixth guy or the or the tight end or even lining him out wide so you you don't expect those things this is a big boy, man. Also a 22 year old or, you know, not, not, not too old, only 22 years of age. Like you said, university of Texas, absolute powerhouse. And for that man at plus 360 to, to run in the, in the low fives, basically it's impressive. I, again, how, how impressive, I don't know, but I, I want that run stuff for so badly this year. I want that beef up the middle so badly. And, uh, the dudes that just can just just make sure that we don't get, as Adam would call it, the ball jelly down our throat over and over and over again, and maybe sweats a, a dude we could we could look out for uh, on draft day. And that's again when I think of impactful drills, the forty yard dash for a defensive tackle is is not one that I, you're really going to care much about. Like you're you're looking more at those ten yard splits, and you want them to be. You know, especially for a guy that big, you want him to be under two, but, you know, probably in the one seven range. We saw a lot of guys on the interior of the defensive line running that one seven, 10 yard split, which is kind of the, I, I think the professional level that you're looking at. And, uh, and then for the edge guys, you're looking at uh, a little bit quicker, but because um, you want to measure that explosiveness. And, and mm -hmm. so coming out of the, coming off the blocks, that 10 yard split is, is more of the explosiveness part of that drill. So uh, yeah, again, it not, not a lot for Tavondre sweat. Like I I'm probably more interested in what he benched and, and those sorts of numbers. But uh, when you, again, when you see a guy moving that quick, uh, it's, it's just kind of fun. Yeah. It just catches the eye, but, and you're right. We want those, the explosive numbers uh, because it's all the, like the short area, the short area stuff. Right. So gotta have big uh, sack. If you're a uh, def defensive lineman, gotta have big sack at what short area quickness for those who are unfamiliar with the acronym. Yeah. 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 Uh, Liatu Latu, one of those fun names, UCLA mm -hmm. edge and uh, Washington fans may remember him too, because he was a, a former Husky before he, entered his neck and and he was one of the guys i felt like was focused on a lot just as a story because yeah. he he broke his neck had neck fusion surgery they talked about how he was out playing rugby uh like two months after his surgery and the seattle rugby team was talking about even signing him uh, until he decided to get back into football he entered the transfer portal went down to ucla and balled out there and so uh, how he and, and another guy that when you watch him move, just like a dude who moves super smooth. Yeah. And he's he's a different type of frame, obviously, than these dudes in the middle. Right. Uh, right. Much, much, much leaner. And this is a this is a, a guy in Latu that when watching some folks put the mock drafts out there, seems like he's often available right in that right in that range for Seattle. And even if Seattle were to trade back a little bit. Maybe it's a player that he sneaks back into the later parts of the first round and is still available. So I wouldn't put, to, you know, from our needs perspective, I wouldn't put defensive end at one of the larger, you know, it's like there's other, there's other areas that, that I would like us to address first. However, um, you know, you can't ignore talent either. And it's not like we have an amazing defensive end core, you know, that that's right. Nuosu coming back from injury, Mafe after a good second year, we we don't know what we got out of the rookie class last year. Who knows if, if Taylor's ever playing a game in Seattle again? Probably not, right? I don't think. I don't. He's think a restricted he's, free agent, so it would be relatively easy to keep him on the roster, depending on what they decide to do with his restricted free agency number, where they decide to tag him if it's an original yeah. round tender or, you know, the back of the draft, which they don't get any compensation if they do anything lower than his original round. But. Okay. Hey, hey, and, and McDonald might like just that, that pure speed that he has displayed. So maybe there's something else that he unlocks. So I'll, I'll take that back and see, maybe just, I'll let, Hey, I'll let coach and Schneider make that call. I'll just, I'll also see that one. So we yeah. don't have the, the most amazing defensive end, uh, and quartet out there just yet. And Derek Hall, of course, being the rookie that I was mentioning with that though, uh, it's to me, Brandon, it's still not the, 
the biggest glaring area of need for the dudes that perform today. It, it's not, but you know, when you look at the way a guy like go to go back to Florida State, Jared Verse, a guy yeah. who comes off the edge, like I, not a guy that I would expect to be there when the Seahawks pick, but a guy who went out, ran a four, five, eight. So a sub four, six 40 for a defensive end, really impressive, you know, had an impressive college career to where I think he's probably going to go top 10. And uh, yeah. So if, if a guy like that were to fall or to fall to a point to where he could move up and take them like pass rushers, whenever you're in range to be able to take one. And if people go quarterback heavy early to where some of the top guys fall back, I, I could, I could see us doing it. Jared versus is a man. This, this, you know, he, he's a dude, right? 20, 23 years old. Cool story too, from a, uh, in upstate New York and Albany and then, and then down the Florida state. So uh, he, he is projected in that, I guess, depending on how he tests, he is projected in that, you know, 10, 10 to 15 range. Uh, m- maybe he lasts a little bit longer. Like you said, maybe he slips likely not typically, typically that, that top edge talent is going to go off the board, especially if they test well and they show those, those elite uh, those elite characteristics and or elite traits uh, from an athletic standpoint, which this dude, this dude's a baller. So uh, yeah, they, that was a very good and fun team to watch last year. Far as they defensively uh, yeah. quite a good team. And he, he's a big reason why. So yeah, someone's going to get it. It looks like someone's going to get another kind of wrecker from Florida state that could bring the noise. And he's not just a speed dude at, at his weight of 260 plus. He's not a rail by any means. He's a, he's just a he's yeah. big and fast. It's a nice combo. Yeah. Good combo there. So yeah, those are kind of the guys I feel like jumped out the most, just like I said, as I was watching along and, uh, but we got some news too. We, well, news ish, uh, <laughs> I think with Jordan Schultz's report, uh, because I, it feels like it's Geno Smith season, uh, each and every day. And the latest, uh, tweet from Jordan Schultz is that, uh, He said the Seahawks have informed Geno Smith he will be on the roster in 2024 under his current contract. I'm told Smith has received commitment from Seattle's front office. And what was your takeaway with this, Clinton? I, well, A, I'm actually happy. And I'm trying to again. Well, I'm happy, Brandon, because I think it was just kind of proving what I always thought was going to be the conclusion here that you have a rookie everything, you know, Rick, a whole, whole new slew of coaches and they have a free square. They did a good job setting up a, I think a well above average quarterback. I think for me, he's a Dak Prescott. Plus if you give Gino a line, he could put up Dak numbers. I, I just know he can, which starts pitching you into top seven, top eight quarterback, maybe even top five. If you, if you get a really good line and a good scheme. I mean, I think Grubb and McDonald, walk in and go, yeah, this is an absolute no brainer. We have a good to very good quarterback on a team friendly deal. So hopefully to put this in the rear view mirror and, and get it done with Brandon, I think is good. The one other, uh, uh, you know, caveat I'd add is I get the feeling that it was becoming a distraction, but the, the way in which John Schneider was like being ambiguous and just kind of, in my opinion, kind of sounding kind of not the smartest answers. It was, it was starting to rub me the wrong way of like, why are we answering like this? Why are we playing these kind of not even coy games? Cause they weren't like smart enough to be coy. It just sounded like a bit unprofessional. Like he wasn't ready to have a press conference. I believe he could build a team, but the decoupling of John Snyder from, from Pete right now, I'm looking at John being like, dude, do you prepare for a press conference like ever? Like this is a part of your job. So I think he got a phone call from, uh, from, you know, the, the front front office and said, Hey, clean it up. And this was, this was the, the result of that. Them just saying, yeah, he's our guy. Let's stop the nonsense. The reason why I don't think that there was that kind of call is that on every Thursday he goes on Seattle sports radio. And I think that would have been the opportunity to then go on and say, Hey guys, ask me a follow-up question about Geno Smith because maybe I stepped in it when I said he's our quarterback until he's not Mm -hmm. uh, during the press conferences on Tuesday, because I I think that's what you're getting at that that's kind of a, you know, a throwaway comment. It doesn't show any kind of confidence. It's just kind of dismissive of the question. And, and so part of the reason why I, I feel like he answered it that way 
And then he got into the discussion of, oh, once we get back, we're going to talk to the coaches. And I mean, Mike McDonald was kind of dismissive of it too. So, and they're talking about having this meeting with the coaches, which is why they're not at the combine. So it almost feels like they want to get together and have that discussion of, of where they see certain players fitting. And because they haven't had those discussions yet, they really don't have good answers, which I, I still feel like you can have a better answer than the ones that we heard from either McDonald or from John Schneider. But for whatever reason, they they made it seem non-committal when they had their opportunities to seem more committal and uh, it ended up coming out to where it, it causes this confusion. I don't think anything of this report other than, because like I said, if John Schneider were really trying to clean it up, he, he wouldn't be feeding a, a one-liner to Jordan Schultz. He would be going on Seattle Sports Radio and, and saying, ask me a question because I know I have this weekly opportunity and here's my my chance to clear it up. I hear you. And that that to me is is potentially an indication of that Jordan Schultz procured the information from you know where, wherever it was from right uh wherever it actually did where, where wherever it actually got to him from and but i the point you made about like mcdonald was unclear you know he was like well i can't say that now and schneider was continuously oddly uh you know wait, baffling and ambiguous with with what he was saying and of course bringing drew up before gino every, every single time almost like it was a like a like a mental tick type thing just bringing him up it's like it's like dude yeah we get that the drew comes before gino alphabetically but like you you could talk about gino as your number one because he's been your number number one guy for two years from now i honestly think that the top brass looked at this and said hey we got great momentum with the hire and everything we got going on this is sullying that like stop the nonsense just mm -hmm. just put it to bed because because we're, we're hurting ourselves right now um that's just my guess it's, it's a absolute speculation uh frankly what i would do if i own the seahawks be like stop <laughs> stop this is See, done. That's where i think you're right i think if that were you <laughs> Frankly, I don't know if the top brass cares that much about what John and Mike are saying right now to that level. Uh, yeah, that, uh, maybe, that, maybe, yeah. yeah. I don't, listen, there's the owners, but then there's like the, the, the operations people that that have to do the day to day, right? So, hey, uh, regardless, I think it's a good thing for our Seahawks. I, I want to give Gino this third year. Frankly, I want to give Gino multiple years if if the team could you know build around him and spend the capital elsewhere. This is a pretty good core, Brandon. We've been, we've been, you know, we've talked through this. We're going to talk through it more. This is not a clean up an aisle seven type thing. This is a good team and give that new regime a chance to, we don't need to go four and 13. There's, we don't need to bottom out with this, with this regime. So we get a, you know, a top three or four pick. It's, I just, I always found that to be kind of dumb conversation and like just the, not, not really. Uh, I, I don't think real, I, sometimes I can be a Pollyanna. I could be a little bit over with like what I think of the team, but looking at it, I think fairly honestly, I still think it's a top third roster overall in the NFL. Not saying no, top five, but a top third roster. You and and we got some gaps to fill for sure. And if the uh, coaching can hit the way we we hope it can, we don't know. We do not know. But if the coaching can do the things we think it can defensively they just get a lot more sound and if grub can unlock a few things it's a good team now again we'll get we'll get close to the season it's still a really good division this is a really good division it's, it's gonna a be a really good division it's a brand new coaching staff that's why my expectations aren't super high like i'm not going into the season saying they better hit the playoffs first year out of the gate type thing and you have to and and if i were to say that it, like if our goal is hitting the playoffs then geno smith likely the best guy to be able to do that i i like i don't think they're going to be able to go out and draft somebody who's going to be able to take this team to the playoffs in their first season as a rookie i, I just i don't think it's that, very that's, unlikely it's yeah. it's not that it's of course it's possible oh yeah we saw it with russ <laughs> Yeah, we saw it with Russ. We saw it with Stroud last year, and, and right. Stroud was what the second overall pick, and that was a mistake by the Panthers. And but that was it. You know, Will Levis maybe he comes along a little bit Not with Purdy the, the year before. Well, yeah, right. The roster is so significantly better with that one. I correct, understand. Correct. Yeah, the, the 2012 Seahawks roster pretty darn good. The the Niners roster really really good. Uh, 
with all that, like the, the best path for, I think the most success year one to, to get a new regime off the docks in the right direction was, and will be Geno Smith. That's now, hopefully that's legitimately locked up and we don't got to come back on a pod in two weeks and be like, I can't believe they actually traded them <laughs> like for a second round. If it's I, a, if it's a haul, that's why I said the last time that I, we talked, like let's, let's set the, the, like you hear the bears saying, Hey, if you want to come up and get number one, we need a generational haul to, that, to come and take the sure. number one pick. Like if we're talking well, that way, then why are we being dismissive of Geno Smith? Like we want more draft picks, not, right, not right. them thinking that, Oh, they may not even like him as their starter. Which was your point the whole time, which which I, I give you give you the kudos and props. I'm just super scared of like where where someone might define hall, you know, a, a hall for Geno Smith. Like, oh, we get a second rounder, that's not enough. But I kind of think that's all you would get, right? You know, like I, I don't think you're I don't think you're getting a first rounder for Geno, and I think he could be worth it to a team, but I, but you get back like a a late first rounder. It's like okay, we don't have a quarterback. Like, and then, and then you're starting, okay, is it going to be Drew? And then you're starting from scratch with a, a Sunday rubber there. It's like, dude, what, what you, like not all of these quarterbacks yet. Yeah, it's, it's a healthy quarterback class. There's a lot of good quarterbacks. Okay. Top three are gone in the, in the first three or four picks, probably top three picks. The other, other good dudes, you know, JJ and others, they're going to be, they're probably gone by the time we pick even at 16. He's been JJ. JJ's probably gone to the Falcons or, or he's probably not on the board. Even if the point being though, is yeah. the, even with that, even with that, not all four or five or six that I'm going to hit. In fact, most of them will flame out or not be really good NFL quarterbacks. That's just the way it goes. You know, could you get a year that is different? Yes. You can get a year that's different. Could it be a year where four of the six dudes uh, are, are really good in uh, pro bowl in and out of pro bowl at uh, times in their career. Yes, you could get that, but the history tells us very much otherwise that you might get one or two that are good NFL quarterbacks and the rest are going to either wash out or be like Mario to mediocre Mario to bad. And that's not good. Right? So all of this for a scratcher, boy, do I hate that plan? Hate it. <laughs> I hate it. Well, I, it just depends on how things go. That's why I think it's smart for John Schneider to do things like meet with Jaden Daniels and meet with Drake May because sure. you don't know what's going to happen when it comes to the draft. You go back to the 49ers all the way when they took Trey Lance in 2021 with the third pick. Like sometimes organizations make dumb, dumb decisions. <laughs> and if they would have taken, I don't know, Justin Fields, or if they would have taken Mac Jones with that third overall pick, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're not drafting Brock Purdy the next year, They'll probably still draft Brock Purdy because they wait until the last pick of the draft. But hmm. you know, maybe he's not maybe even not playing the- because you have one of these other guys. And I just think that, yeah, if that one thing, the the butterfly effect of Trey Lance going with that third pick and how it ended up affecting the other teams, how is that going to impact it? So, yeah, that's yeah. why you interview because you know I see other news like Washington, uh, they have their owner that's going to all these meetings at the combine, and I just think that here we here we are all over again mm-hmm. with ownership daniel snyder style ownership wanting to be a part of the process and not knowing stuff about football but hey if the owner goes ooh i really like the spencer rattler guy like look <laughs> at him throw out there and maybe he was projected in the second round and then all of a sudden oh owner want the owner's really liking spencer rattler maybe, maybe we need to take him uh with one of our top picks and that again changes the draft board drastically so it's stuff like that, that you just, it's, it's hard to know. And that's why you have to be prepared. Sure. And you, you'd go do all the interviews and you, and you talk to all of them. And uh, often we've, I've heard Pete and John talk about in the past that like they would do those kind of things. Sometimes literally looking at like years ahead, Hey, I wanted to go meet Drake may because whatever year set, whatever it is, like his second contract, third contract, right. Th- those dudes, they of course they're going to remember that, a- especially if other uh, coaches and GMs who are let's say down the board who who also have no real shot at May without you know without 
uh, selling the farm. Right. But, but there's probably some that just don't take the time to go do the human thing, which is like, you know what? I want to go talk to these QBs most likely. Right. So they're going to remember that. Or John's just a charming person and he'll make an impression. And that's part of his job, right? As bad as, as he is on the microphone or press conferences, he might be delightful. He probably is delightful in, in real life to, you know, to, to have a, a fun conversation with. And that's what they'll remember. And that, of course, builds your brand equity, uh, which, by the way, I, the other day I was thinking uh, slightly different topic, but I was thinking about, you know, with Pete exiting and this transition in like the the hall of really seemingly really great coaches that we were able to bring in. We'll see how it all shakes out. But we got the best defensive coach that was out there that they, you know that everybody said, hey, that's that's the dude. And uh, and then and then Grub gets over here, and most people seem to really like that as well. I I, also, I was also thinking like you know you really got to at least go back a little bit and thank Pete Carroll because he set up what is a a platform. You know mm -hmm. there was a establishing a new uh, you know a, a new standard in Seattle, being like okay, this is what this is about. This kind of football out here is like this. This is not a commander style thing where it's it's. They have a brand new owner and all of a sudden it's a Jerry Jones 2.0, right? And, and the, the owner's involved in everything and, and then can't land, can't land McDonald's. So right. I just wanted to give a little more love to Pete on the, on the way out here too. Cause I was thinking about that being like, wow, I don't think if Pete does as good a job as he did, then John gets a chance to go get the coaches and go yank coaches away. Cause the commanders were like supposedly like on the dotted line of McDonald and, Flew him out of there like the like the Browns uh, leaving town. So a little more love for Pete. That's all. Well, love for Pete. It also gives you a little bit of love going back to the late Paul Allen and mm, right. the fact that he was able to bring in Mike Holmgren, and then that led into Pete too. So uh, definitely having that uh, leadership at the top and and making those things happen for sure. It, it definitely led to uh, the ability to to keep things going. And that's why the top brass picked up the phone and said, "You clean it up." <laughs> Lean it up. Stop with the not like we built up too much equity over the last 20 years for you to go out there and sound like a dumb dumb. Stop. Clean it up. And uh, they did. And that's why Gino's with us. I, I love the idea. I don't love the execution <laughs> of that's how you clean it up. But that's fine. That was the, the news of the day with Geno Smith. If you want to make sure you are getting all our news, you can go to youtube.com slash Seahawkers podcast. Follow along there. Subscribe to the show. Give us a like on the video. If you want to become a member of the flock, you can go to getintheflock.com. Help support the show. Five bucks a month and above gets you into our Discord. And we've been chatting around uh, the Discord there throughout the week as the combine's going on and we're seeing some of this news. So, uh, appreciate everybody who is involved and Clinton appreciate you hopping on today and, and talking to Seahawks with me. Oh, I appreciate that, Brent. It's been, it's fun. I, NFL does a marvelous job of just, just keeping the momentum going. We got this and then it'll be free agency and then it'll be draft season. Away we go, Brandon. We're in it. I love it. And I think with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.